Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 21 of Ben Franklin's World the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. Each week, we sit down with an historian to discuss their unique insights into our early American past so we can learn more about who we are and how we can affect a better future. Today, we have a real treat. Today's episode is kind of like a two-for-one deal. I spoke with my good friend and colleague, Dr. Eugene Tesdall, an assistant professor of history at the University of Wisconsin, Platteville. Gene not only studies the very interesting history of smuggling in colonial North America, but he also participates in living history as an historical reenactor. As a result, today's episode really has two parts. The first half of our conversation focuses on smuggling in colonial North America. Specifically, we discuss the notorious Albany-Montreal fur trade, which took place between about 1700 and 1754. And the second half of our conversation explores the world of living history or historical reenactment. During the first part of our chat, Jean reveals how the 18th century governments of Great Britain and France defined smuggling and why colonial North Americans opted to smuggle goods between New France and British North America what types of goods the Albany traders exchanged with the French fur traders for peltry, and the role Native American and Euro-American women played in the illegal Albany-Montreal smuggling trade. Now, during the second part of our exchange, Jean will help us dive deeper into the everyday lives of the French colonists in New France by discussing his participation in living history and how historical reenacting helps him better understand and convey early American history. Now, I hope you'll stay tuned to the end of this episode, because Gene was also kind enough to recommend nine or ten books about the French and Indian War period so we can further our knowledge. I will tell you where you can find that list after our conversation with Dr. Eugene Tesdall. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Eugene Tesdall is an assistant professor of history at the University of Wisconsin, Platteville. He specializes in the history of French, British, and Native American empires in early North America. When not teaching or revising his dissertation, The Price of Empire, Smuggling Between New York and New France, 1700 to 1754, into a book manuscript, Jean participates in first-person historical interpretation or living history of the French and Indian War era. Jean often portrays the composite character of an unlicensed fur trader or coureur de bois, Henri-Francois Le Tanier. Jean believes that only by paddling birch bark canoes, snowshoeing, and camping in sub-zero temperatures with only wool, linen, leather, and fur clothing to protect him can he gain valuable insight into the period and people he studies. Jean, welcome to Ben Franklin's world. Thank you, Liz. I'm happy to be here. Gene, we've known each other for a while. I was thinking before the show, like, when did we meet? 2007? 2008? I don't think it was any... It must have been 2008, I believe, in the Clements Library Archives in scenic Ann Arbor, Michigan. Yeah, I was on fellowship there researching my dissertation, and I'd been going through the Thomas Gage papers all day, and this tall, nice fellow came up and he says, hey, do you want to grab a pizza and a beer? And that was just what I needed at the end of a day of looking at manuscripts all day. Me too. And I was looking at manuscripts regarding the illicit fur trade in in the Great Lakes. And both of us, I think, uh, found a lot of what we needed there at the Clements. Yeah, the Clements Library at the University of Michigan is an awesome place to research early American history if you ever have the chance. It is. So, Gene, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and how you found your passion for early American history? Sure. Well, one phrase that really resonates with me, uh, Bernard Balin, a noted historian 
said a few years ago in an interview, quote, but in any case, you don't have to be brought up on a pig farm to write as Virginia Anderson, who grew up in a Connecticut city, is now doing about pigs and cattle in the 17th century. One can write with great acuity about things one has not personally experienced, end quote. And I start with that quote. It has resonated with me over the years because I, as you know, am the son of an Iowa hog farmer. And as you said in my intro, I don't write about hogs. I write about uh, French, British, and Native nations in the 17th and 18th centuries. And uh, even my family, we are not descended of 17th and 18th century immigrants to North America were more recent arrivals. And yet I've been fascinated by this period since a very young age because this is an interesting time when the Atlantic world brings Native Americans, Africans, and Europeans together, not just in conflict, but often in compromise. And those ways are really exciting to see unfold. So what brought you to the infamous, and I've read the records, it was infamous, Albany, Montreal fur trade between uh, 1700 and 1754? Sure. Well, as is so often the case in historical research or other research, we begin with a research question, and while we are pursuing the answer to that, we run into other things that seem more interesting or seem more confusing. So when I was researching Mariage à la façon du pays now many years ago, which is intermarriage between French men and Native women, I found that there were all these footnotes and then often primary document references to le traite illégal or the contraband trade or the Albany trade or the Montreal trade in especially the early 18th century. And this fascinated me. Often there would be similar brief mentions of the trade. So as you said, it was infamous, and yet sometimes it would not provide depth or complexity to what certainly had both depth and complexity. So like like several other historians lately, uh, among them Keese, Kisian Waterman and Jan Knoll, I decided to probe into this story further, and it has kept me busy. So let's explore this trade a little bit. So as you know, Albany is really established in 1614 when the Dutch established Fort Nassau, um, or if you live in New York today, Fort Nassau, as a Dutch fur trading outpost. They're, They're there to trade with Native Americans to get peltry. And over time, that outpost grows into the village of Baversvike, later Albany after 1664. And they're already in the business of the fur trade. So why does this outpost, beginning in 1700, really have to look to Montreal and the citizens of New France to get their furs? Sure, this is a complex question. The, the first thing, let's define smuggling. So smuggling is trade outside a set of rules, and usually those rules are wrapped around a European nation state or some sort of controlling body. Contrary to what we might think today, those rules are not always aimed to restrict dangerous or immoral materials like weapons or tobacco or firearms. Oftentimes, especially in the colonial period of North America, they were aimed to protect the interest of the colonizing nation. This was mercantilism at its best. Colonies were designed to supply raw materials and markets for a mother country, and this then would leave most of the manufacturing and the profits back in Europe. In the case of the Albany-Montreal trade of the early 18th century, this would then most directly profit England and France uh, and the metropoles thereof. So it did not take long for many enterprising individuals in the colonies to see that this was not very efficient. And as is the case today, where there is inefficiency, there's also often profit. So smugglers, uh, native French 
British and after 1664, Anglo-Dutch, uh, Dutch-speaking people who were able to essentially acculturate there at Albany, they were able to thwart those distant imperial bureaucrats uh, who were tasked with policing smuggling, and they had a much clearer view of what life was uh, in New France, New York, and what the Haudenosaunee, or Iroquois, often called Ganienka. And so from time to time, it was deemed that smuggling was either a benefit, and at that time, it would not be uh, scrutinized. And at other times, it was deemed that smuggling was a liability. So from time to time, there would be acts that were put in place to police this illicit trade and protect the interests of the colonies of New York or New France, notably on the British side, the acts of navigation and trade in 1651 were meant to do this. They did not always do it. And uh, colonial officials did not only, not always aim to enforce them. And a series of edicts in New France then were aimed to restrict smuggling and trade with outside parties. One of the most famous in this period was an edict issued by Louis the 15th in 1727. So Jean, let's explore the navigation acts because you mentioned that the colonies, the, the idea behind the colonies is that they're supposed to supply raw materials to the mother country or fatherland. So England passes these navigation acts. Would you tell us how that either facilitates or hinders the colony's ability to send raw materials back to the mother country? Sure. So for the most part, the acts of navigation and trade since the 17th century and into the 18th century and these edicts to restrict trade in the French colonies, on paper, they look like they work very well. For the most part, in places like New York, you have in the 17th century furs and peltry, you have lumber, you have even commodities like ginseng and maple sugar going back to uh, Europe. New France, you have uh, those items and um, even some other items as well. And so for the most part, this seems to certainly bolster the manufacturing sector of Europe. It also does a very effective job of hampering the development of a manufacturing sector in New York and New France. And since this is all wrapped up with transatlantic trade, uh, to a certain extent, it's also wrapped up with forms of labor control from indentured servitude to chattel slavery, uh, slavery both of sub-Saharan West Africans and especially in New France of native peoples. It's also wrapped up in the fact that while both Albany and Montreal are linked into these transatlantic trade networks by the early 18th century, that beaver populations, especially in New York, have dropped drastically by the 18th century. And while you have explained how the Dutch had traded for furs well before the English period. Some of those Anglo-Dutch families were able to perpetuate this myth of beavers right in the heart of Albany into the 18th century. And so that's part of why this smuggling corridor uh, grew and ultimately came to thrive in the early 18th century. So the Navigation Acts really require, and the, and the trade edicts from France as well, really require these furs. They're designed to send furs and these other valuable commodities back to the mother country before they start trading them within the colonies. What goods are the smugglers trading amongst each other? We know that the Dutch or the Dutch English are getting furs from the French, but what are the Dutch and Dutch English sending to the French colonists of New France for the furs? Sure, and that's a... A good question. So basically, you had the brunt of this illicit trade is actually serving native consumers, uh, particularly of the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois Confederacy, the people of the Longhouse. And many of the people dictating the trade then are, interestingly, not Haudenosaunee men, but often native women. And 
some of them were doing much of the trading and exchanging themselves. In New France, we even have a uh, cast of both uh, single and married women as well who are doing more of this trade than their English counterparts. Among them, some that I have studied are Marianne, Marie Madeleine, and Marguerite de Saunier, who were sisters. We also had a, a prominent widow, Catherine Daniel, uh, who was also a prominent smuggler and uh, a figure who at times was in Montreal and at times was in Albany was Genevieve Massé Lydius, who was quite a prominent figure as well. And so these smugglers on both sides, um, native, French, Anglo-Dutch, and English, they often wanted some of the same things from furs. They wanted woolens, and particularly woolens, textiles, and finished clothing are, in fact, the highest amount of things that are being traded both legitimately and as contraband in the 18th century at both Albany and Montreal. Where Albany comes in to the picture here is that in the 18th century, English woolens are generally already of a much higher quality than uh, French woolens. And also in the 1720s, there is a bout of bubonic plague that spreads in the south of France in Montpellier, which in fact then is where the woolen industry in France was located. This really decimates French wool production that was already deemed inferior to English wool production. So not only is British wool better, it's also in much higher quantity in the early 18th century. And so there's there's woolens, uh, there's other tools, and uh, to a certain extent, weapons. There's also brandy, which is being trafficked in this trade, although in comparison to the textiles, all of this is much smaller. The textiles are over 80%. And part of what is fascinating to me then is while many of these goods are going to native consumers, particularly those who are dominating a more robust beaver population in New France, also then you have French and British colonists who are also tapping into this trade as well and are eager to get access to these goods. One of the aspects of your research that really fascinated me was the fact that the Albany-Montreal trade was conducted and facilitated by so many French and Native American women. Would you tell us about the Desaunier sisters and John Henry Lydius's wife um, and how they became involved in the trade and what their roles were? Sure. And uh, first off is to say that, in fact, while some of the figures who come into best view at this time are some of these French women uh, or French Canadian women, there were many more, several hundred Haudenosaunee and other Native American women who were very prominent in this trade as well. Uh, sometimes these were mere porters, as they are described at the time, transporting the goods and furs. At other times, they are growing into petite marchands or traders themselves. And at sometimes it seems a few of them were able to even get much more successful than that. So it's important to note that while some of these native women do not come into such sharp focus, that in fact their contributions in many ways are much more significant. Uh, and many of them, we only have some of their names like Sauvages Agnès or Marie Madeleine, uh, and the translation on some of these women is simply a descriptor like Mary Madeleine with one bad eye, whom you know well. Um, but back to the Desaunier sisters and Genevieve Massé Lydius. Uh, so Marie Anne, Marie Madeleine, and Marguerite Desaunier were descended of one of the most prominent fur trade families of Montreal. They had quite a charmed life in their upbringing. And interestingly, then in 1725, these young women, all in their uh, 20s, are permitted to open a fur trade post at the French Jesuit mission of Sault Ste. Louis, what uh, some bands of Mohawks are already calling New uh by 1725. And this village 
is on the south bank of the St. Lawrence River, just outside of Montreal. So it was very near where the Desaunier sisters grew up, and the mission had been there since the late 17th century. It had moved once, and the establishment of Sault Ste. Louis was very significant in the uh, contraband trade, but also in Haudenosaunee life and culture. So in 1725, these Desaunier sisters were able to establish the post partially due to the influence of their brother and uh, their father, both known as Pierre Trottier Desaunier. And on the face of it, it was suggested that this mission was these young unwed women. uh, It was their opportunity to help the Jesuit priests at Sault Ste. Louis minister to the mostly Mohawk uh, people there at Sault Ste. Louis. But in fact, it's clear by even 1726 that this is a very robust trading post. It also becomes clear by even the late 1720s that the Desaunier sisters are often having a trade house that's full of textiles, woolens, uh, china, uh, even Delftware that is not coming from Montreal. It's coming 196 miles to the south at Albany uh, on what I have called the River and Highway. Uh, we also then have Genevieve Massé Lydius, who she herself is an interesting figure. She was Métis, part French and part native. We don't know the lineage of her mother exactly, but we know she was Algonquin speaking. Her father then uh, pairs her uh, in a marriage in 1727 with uh, John Henry Lydius, who had all sorts of aliases due to his involvement in smuggling uh, Johannes Hendricus, John Henry, John Henricks, and uh, Jean-Henri Lydius. And she herself, though, is involved in this trade, certainly partially due to the connections of her family, not just by this scurrilous Anglo-Dutchman who she happened to marry. You know, it seems really fascinating to me that you were able to find out so much about the Desaunier sisters um, and the Lydiuses as well, because it seems to me that smugglers would prefer... I mean, they preferred to remain anonymous. Nobody wanted them to know who they were. Otherwise, you know, there were legal ramifications to their acts. So how did you go about tracking these smugglers? Um, and, and where did you find information about them? It's difficult. <laughs> this, is, this is not easy. As you say, smugglers, whether the 18th century or the 21st century, do very well to keep their tracks hidden. In some ways, some of these figures remind me a lot of a more recent smuggler, Victor Boot, uh, infamous Russian smuggler who trafficked especially arms, so much so that he was known as the Merchant of Death, and he was caught in 2008 in Bangkok, Thailand, when he's ultimately deemed a threat uh, by the U.S., although he had helped the U.S. years before. This also then is interesting to me because this smuggling in times of peace in the 18th century was trafficking things like furs and cloth. And then during times of war, this would then be trafficking uh, muskets, ammunition, also rope and other wartime stores, along with tactical information. And uh, the same, you see the same things in smuggling corridors in places like Afghanistan today. So like uh, Victor Boot, uh, Lydius, and the uh, Desaunier sisters, and Catherine Daniel were very good at practicing discretion, and yet they have not been impossible to track. Particularly helpful, as with some other scholars, have been... The, some letter books, journals, diaries, and especially court records, uh, because like today, oftentimes where lawbreakers show up is uh, in, in court records. So I've probed collections in the U.S. and Canada to, to find the tracks of some of these prominent smugglers. And two particularly interesting documents um, – 
the journal, or, or I should say the letter book of Robert Saunders and um, his brother John that was maintained at Albany. John would later mostly be trading at Schenectady, New York. Uh, Robert Saunders would keep a very interesting journal uh, or, or an interesting letter book in the 1750s. In it, he would vary from writing uh, copies of letters in English, Dutch, and French, partially to hide his tracks and knowing that if anyone ever got a hold of letters or especially his letter book, that they may not write, read all three of those languages. At times, he also is using some terms in Haudenosaunee uh, and especially Mohawk language. And interestingly, he has then ascribed to some of his business contacts code names. So this is really fascinating that uh, in the mid 18th century, some of these smugglers uh, were uh, using code names, and particularly the Saunders, for the most part, are deemed legitimate traders, and yet they're clearly doing some contraband trade, and they're also doing a, a very good job of hiding their tracks. Um, and so some of the um, contacts that Saunders uh, protects, and in the process protects himself, some of them are native, and so they are uh, given ideograms, drawings uh, that are like a signature for some of these people from a smoldering pipe to a uh, partridge. And at other times, they're just uh, given the name Monsieur and then a Roman numeral, Monsieur 12, Monsieur 13. And in a couple of cases, I was able to crack the code, I believe, uh, particularly then in Monsieur, the case of Monsieur 13, this seems to be uh, John Henry Lydius and uh, Madame Massé is mentioned in uh, uh, one of those letters. Uh, another document that has been very useful uh, at the National Archives of Canada, and uh, it's also a copy of it is in France, uh, is this journal by uh, Catherine Dagnot, who is also known as the Veuve La Chauvinerie. Uh, she herself was a smuggler, and she starts keeping a journal between 1729 and 1731. She gives uh, great accounts of different um, smugglers. She names names, and she even curiously takes aims at other competing smugglers uh, while protecting herself. Uh, she even partially condemns her uh, friends and associates, the Desaunier sisters, but doesn't name their name, so they remain protected as well. Well, it sounds like you found a lot of information even when these people didn't keep a lot of information, so... Good for them for not being too careful. Good for you, I guess I should say. Right. Good Good for history. Um, so how long did the Albany-Montreal trade continue? And did France and England ever try to stop it? They did. And again, part of this is wrapped up in periods of commerce and periods of tension. As you know, the early 18th century saw really a protracted relationship of enmity between the British and the French. And there would also be one of the largest periods of peace or detente between the British and the French uh, in the early 18th century as well. So the height of this smuggling was between 1701 and 1763. So 1701 is significant, especially from the Haudenosaunee per perspective, because this is when uh, the Haudenosaunee, led by their very visionary La Goene, or clan mothers, council of clan mothers, decided in 1701 in two separate treaties to establish neutrality between the British and the French in two separate treaties, which we know as the Grand Settlement. When they did that, when they established neutrality, then in both trade and diplomacy, the Haudenosaunee found themselves very able to play the French and British off each other, both with diplomatic negotiations and in trade. They had some uh, competitor to argue for better terms. And this neutrality then would be largely maintained 
from 1701 until the opening of the Seven Years' War, uh, which began in 1754, and one could say the Haudenosaunee would then fully side with the British by at least the middle point of that war. And when they did, this was the tipping point that would yield a British victory in the Seven Years' War by 1763. So the smuggling would go on throughout this period, and during times of war, as in uh, Queen Anne's War uh, from 1702 to 1713, and again in King George's War, 1744 to 1748, I have been very fascinated to see that the smuggling, even trafficking furs and woolens, continues during those wars, but then the smuggling carries on different meanings during wartime. As smuggling systems today change during wartime, you start to see many more wartime stores during especially King George's War, more muskets, more powder, uh, more uh, uniforms and rope and things needed to, uh, to execute a war. And also you see very important uh, during wartime is both the French and the British recognize that these smugglers, especially these Haudenosaunee women, are giving invaluable tactical information. And the Haudenosaunee recognize this as well, for they too are continuing to weigh the position that they're in, especially when Haudenosaunee neutrality is in effect. The way this uh, smuggling goes on then, during times of war, most British and French officials who are tasked with policing smuggling, they see that during wartime, even when smugglers then have a much higher profile, that they are much more invaluable during periods of war. So it's usually periods immediately following a war, as in 1751, while the De Saunier sisters had been actively uh, engaged in this trade since 1725, just three years after King George's War ended was when finally the governor of Nouvelle-France, uh, La Jonquière, would uh, push to expel Marianne, Mary Madeleine, and Marguerite de Saunier for smuggling. And when he did, just months later, after 1751, they were expelled to La Rochelle. Just months later, these three dynamic entrepreneurs had established a new uh, trading enterprise in La Rochelle, where they would be dealing with commodities from North America, the Caribbean, and Africa. Gene, you know, I find your research fascinating and we could talk about it all day, but I'd like to transition and talk about your alter ego, Henri Francois Latanier. Now, you don't just study the French and Indian War period. You actually relive the period. And I don't mean just going to Fortress Louisbourg or Montreal or some of these sites to see the geography. I mean, you dress up as a French and Indian War trader and relive history. So would you tell us about your living history experience and specifically about your alter ego? Who is Henri Francois Le Tanier and how did you find him? I have found my passion for living history or first person interpretation over many years. And some people then who know of living history, they they either love it or they might uh, deem it hokey or a strange way to encounter history. I absolutely love it, and I fell in love with it at the age of nine. Uh, I was a farm kid, and I had shoveled a lot of manure, and I was good at that, but I hated doing it. And that would all change when my parents took me to Living History Farms in Des Moines, Iowa, to a reproduced 1840s farm. And after I'd spoken with a costumed interpreter for a while, he asked me to help him move some manure with a historic fork. And it would then take my parents over an hour to pull me away from this. So uh, something I hated to do. So this is the power of living history. It takes even the mundane and it makes it both educational and entertaining. And I think it's important to think that 
first-person historical interpretation, it will never supplant rigorous primary and secondary research, but when it's done well, it can really uh, light passion for students and the public alike. So, in 1996, uh, I had already been doing historical reenacting for a while of the French fur trade and the Seven Years' War period, and I decided to create a new persona, Henri-François Letoyer. So, as you noted, this is a composite character. He was not actually a person. Uh, as far as I know, no person by this actual name did exist in New France, uh, but what I have sculpted him to be similar to street theater then is that he was very common of unlicensed fur traders in the 17th and 18th centuries of New France, known as Coro du Bois. Uh, so these unlicensed traders uh, played a very important role in New France, particularly wrapped up in <coughs> excuse me, some of these policies to restrict trade within the French Empire there at varying periods were as little as only a few dozen congés or uh, permits for trading for furs in New France, and yet most people who were living in New France were engaged in the fur trade. So you had it at any given time hundreds of these Curl du Bois, and yet to publicly call someone a Curl du Bois could land you in court for uh, for libel. Uh, even when that person, in fact, might have even been the third generation of unlicensed trader in his family. So I've been uh, giving presentations as Henri-François Letoyer uh, for nearly two decades. And uh, in fact, this very week at uh, the University of wisconsin Platteville, I delivered a lecture as uh, Le Tonnier. I listed him as my guest lecturer. My students did not know that it would be me in 18th century dress. I opened by addressing the class in Anishinaabe Moan, which is an Algonquin dialect uh, largely known as Ojibwe. I then switched to speaking in, to them in French, and then I finally addressed them in English with a French accent. And so for 35 minutes, I interact with my class as if the year is 1750. They then pose questions to me about material culture and about trade and religion in New France. And then I break character. I take my hat off and I drop the accent. And then we spend the rest of the time discussing the benefits and limitations of first-person historical interpretation as an educational tool. Well, your students aren't the only people who are interested in your experiences as Henri Francois. When I posted to Poor Richard's Club, the private Facebook community for Ben Franklin's World listeners, and to Twitter that I would be interviewing you. Many listeners reached out and p want to know the answers to their questions. So, for example, listener Michelle would like to know how religious Henri Francois is and how French he feels when he lives so far away from France. Thanks, Michelle. These are good questions. Religion in all of colonial North America is not as clear cut as some history books would have us believe. And this is especially true in Nouvelle France, where we have such an interdependence between native cultures, uh, mostly Algonquin speaking cultures and French culture uh, in New France. And that also then spreads to religion. So Henri, like most actual Coro du Bois by the early 18th century, he uh, then largely sees himself as Catholic. Uh, when I dress as Henri, I wear several uh, St. Anne's medals, uh, which are cast off originals, often from archaeological sites. St. Anne was the patron saint of mothers and sailors, but by the 17th century, she's also then deemed the patron saint of engagé, or French voyageurs, of canoe paddlers. And so it was very common for uh, canoe paddlers and uh, petite marchand or traders like Henri to wear these uh, medals and particularly to pray to St. Anne uh, when they were on rivers and lakes, uh, which they often were, especially if they were paddling the over 2,000 miles from Montreal to the interior of the Western Great Lakes, uh, as I often discuss Henri doing. Uh, 
What's interesting is that many Algonquin-speaking nations like the Odawa or the Ojibwe or the Potawatomi are also uh, largely uh, Catholic or at least baptized uh, by the 18th century, and many of them are are wearing uh, St. Anne's medals, and there's even a great depiction of some Huron children in a painting from the late 17th century, where as their canoe is sinking in this painting, they are praying to St. Anne to, to save them. Uh, Henri then also wears uh, a native uh, amulet, um, which is made of brain tanned deer skin and uh, is decorated with folded and dyed porcupine quills, known as quill work. And it was then very common for uh, uh, Coral Dubois, like Henri, to also then uh, be very aware of. Uh, native cosmology, particularly the Algonquin speaking belief in Monadu or spirit, that uh, most things, animate or inanimate, would have uh, spirits that would need to be respected, uh, particularly when paddling on, say, uh, La Mer Douce or Lake Superior, the notion uh, and awareness of a uh, creature uh, known as the Gichi Pichu, or the underwater panther, was something that both natives and uh, many, many French Canadians uh, observed and aimed to uh, aimed to honor anything they thought would keep them from being capsized. So Michael would like to know how Henri Francois lives and what he eats. Thanks, Michael. So uh, Henri, being a a Creole, uh, born French heritage, but born in North America, uh, saw himself certainly as uh, a, an active member of La Nouvelle France. And um, food then is an interesting topic, uh, particularly then whether uh, a Creole de Bois like Henri, whether he would be at his uh, stone home in Montreal, uh, which he might be during the winter months, or if he is living in the interior, uh, something that was called living en de ruine. Um, so while he was trading, uh, he would be living with Algonquin speaking and other native peoples, and so uh, eating much more uh, of food common to them. And he would also partially be trading with Native people, particularly Native women, for food and sometimes clothing, especially moccasins, for himself and also those young engagés or voyageurs who were helping him paddle birch bark canoes loaded with trade goods coming from Montreal or back to Montreal loaded with furs. And so uh, one thing about food, Michael, is that for the most part in the 18th century, roasted meat uh, was very popular by both uh, Canadians and uh, natives. And so uh, roasted meat, particularly wild game, uh, you saw this even in Montreal, as well as in uh, Anishinaabe Odena in Ojibwe villages. You'd have duck, venison, beaver, and buffalo. Uh, and again, sometimes that would be on plates in Montreal as well. And in Montreal, you would have certainly more beef and pork, uh, even salt pork uh, packed in, in lard and uh, shoved into barrels. Sometimes this would be taken from Montreal. Montreal, but again, it would not last long. So when when French fur traders were traveling into the interior, into uh, upstate New York and further west into the Great Lakes, uh, you saw them particularly turning to many more native foods, uh, monomen or wild rice or mashkigimen, uh, cranberry, usually dried cranberry, and uh, zinzibakwad, zinzibakwad, uh, maple sugar uh, that you would get in cakes from native peoples. Um, these three foodstuffs, wild rice, cranberry, and maple sugar, sometimes eaten together in a stew called a wapu, uh, which is sometimes uh, bastardized into a term known as rubaboo uh, by the late 18th century. Uh, eating stews like this were very common, and also uh, 
eating a lot of pemmican. Pemmican is pulverized jerk, uh, pulverized dried meat, uh, depending on if you're in the East or the West, it might be dried and pulverized venison or moose closer to Montreal. And when you got closer to say modern cities of Duluth, Minnesota or Thunder Bay, Ontario, uh, this would often have more, uh, pulverized dried, um, bison meat in it. And then it would have a lot of buffalo uh, fat and then would sometimes have a little sugar in it or some dried uh, cranberry or blueberry in it as well. Another thing that I often eat, Michael, while dressed as Henri is ship's bread or biscuit. Um, Ship's bread and biscuit or biscuit uh, is essentially a uh, an unleavened bread, and as I like to say, it tastes and looks a lot like terracotta bathroom tile, uh, and so you have to soak it in order to eat it. And I know a bit about these foods because often I, I am eating these actual foods when I am not presenting in classes, but sometimes when I'm even paddling birch bark canoes or snowshoeing out, out in the woods. Some of those dishes sound actually very delicious. I'm impressed with Henri Francois's palate. Now, John would like to know what the life expectancy for a coureur de bois like Henri Francois was. And, you know, did the coureurs de bois live a, a, a shorter lifespan than those who lived in urban or settled areas? Thanks, John. Uh, yes, this is a good question. And generally, yes, it seems they they lived shorter, uh, though any good historical question, the first answer is, it depends. And so particularly those young men who were not actually Curl de Bois, but were just the paddlers of canoes, those French Canadian voyageurs or engagés, uh, they uh, usually had a, a much shorter lifespan like uh, indentured servants or uh, some enslaved people at the time, uh, they were doing very hard manual labor, sometimes paddling canoes 12 or even 16 hours a day uh, when they ran out of river or lake between Montreal or the interior, they would be portaging canoes and goods and furs, which means to empty your canoe and carry goods usually in packs weighing about 180 pounds a piece uh, over the portage or trail, and then you had to move the canoe and continue paddling. So this was very rigorous work, and it's what one of my uh, colleagues, Carl Coster, has called uh, voyageurs the over-the-road truckers of the 18th century, which uh, really deems how much of the culture of New France kind of um, viewed voyageurs. They they did not respect them very much. And like Coral Dubois, then they um, didn't necessarily mind that their lifespans might have been shorter, but they also recognized that uh, even when the Coral Dubois were essentially, in a way, uh, smuggling or at least breaking the uh, edicts meant to prevent too much uh, trading for furs, they knew that it was part of the economic lifeblood of New France. And so a uh, figure like Henri, he might have died in his 30s, like many engagés did, or he could have lived to his 50s or a bit older, and particularly if he was able to get out of the trade uh, and if not retire, then do more trading from uh, Trois-Rivières or Quebec or Montreal, then that, of course, uh, would be a very different story that uh, might have him enjoying a little more stable life on the stone streets of Montreal. Now, Gene, this is my question. Henri Francois has been known to paddle birch bark canoes upstream, snowshoe through the woods, and camp in sub-zero temperatures with just period clothing. I would really like to know about these experiences and how they help you better connect with and better understand the 1700 to 1754 period that you study. Sure, Liz. Full disclosure, though, I have never paddled a birch bark canoe upstream, and I hope never to. But over the past two decades, I have logged over 1,000 miles paddling birch bark canoes 
And uh, one month ago, I was snowshoeing and camping with friends in 18th century fashion near Duluth, Minnesota. One of the nights, it was 10 below. And a few years ago, I was in fact uh, camping when it was 30 degrees below zero without wind chill. And that night, I knew it was cold because the next morning, one of my friends had even developed pleurisy, liquid freezing in his lungs. Mm. Uh, And so this is what some people say then is perhaps uh, taking history a little too far. Uh, One does not want to ever get hurt. But when you do things like this, you get calluses on your hands from paddling uh, for several days, or you get really cold uh, camping in buffalo robes and hand-woven blankets. Uh, This this might give you a little closer appreciation of what 18th century life was actually like. One thing that I think is important, that while I, I certainly love doing this, and as I said, for me, first personal First person historical interpretation. Sometimes it's done at historic sites, and sometimes I present it as an educational tool in the classroom or to community groups. But I also often do it uh, with f- friends who who do it as well, and it's not done for the public. And sometimes it's in moments like that uh, where you really learn the most about yourself and possibly some things about the past. Uh, Two years ago, I was on a short 20-mile birch bark canoe trip with two friends. Uh, We then um, were eating pemmican out of a dried uh, buffalo container known as a toho. uh, And my friend had uh, shot the buffalo in the pemmican using his flintlock musket. He'd uh, taken it on the Assiniboine Reservation uh, out in the west and uh, made the pemmican himself. So that's just one example that eating traditional foods prepared in a traditional way and uh, eating them over a fire in a traditional fashion then really brings to life a primary document description of doing that exact thing. I also believe it's very important that... uh, Reenactors or others understand that even as valuable as this might be offering insight to an earlier period of life, it is impossible to 100% uh, recreate life of the 18th century. And uh, that even uh, with some of the steps that I take, I, I fully know that I'm a 21st century uh, person and and not a Corot de Bois of the early 18th century. And I'm really glad to be able to take a shower uh, and to have central heat after I'm done doing these kinds of things. I'm glad you could take a shower, too, because I often feel that I would like to witness certain things of the past, but I really don't want to ever smell it. Right. And in fact, that's one of the things that uh, we will will never, thankfully, uh, be able to know about the true 18th century, especially with Europeans, uh, we know that sometimes they were maybe only thoroughly bathing twice a year. So I'm with you, Liz. So how does someone get involved in living history? Is there a directory of groups or and how do you select the period you wish to reenact? Sure. This is a good question. So living history groups are, in fact, all over the world. Uh, They are especially popular in North America and they they span many time periods. So there are directories of historical reenactment groups. And those are good things to think about. Well, Gene, you've been very generous with your time, but before we let you go, we must go to the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Are you ready for your time warp question, Gene? I am. All right. In your opinion, what might have happened if the governors of New York or New France had stopped the Albany Montreal fur trade before the French and Indian War? What would the impact have been on Native American and colonial societies in New York and New France? This is a great question. 
and and indeed at times perhaps this this nearly happened and it's the role of contingency that makes the consideration of some counterfactuals then very worthwhile. So, for instance, if that edict issued by Louis XV in 1727 had actually completely stopped the flow of goods, furs, and information from New France to New York and vice versa, many things would have been different. In many ways, life and communication between Haudenosaunee, French, British and Anglo-Dutch people would have almost nearly stopped. That particularly would have been very true by 1745 during King George's War when New England militias, sailors, and the British Navy took the fortress of Louisbourg, you mentioned earlier, and they held it for three years. When they did that, this river and highway that linked Albany to Montreal became not just a minor trickle of trade, but it became the main corridor by which information, wartime stores, and uh, trade and communication happened in eastern North America. So if the smuggling would have stopped, not only would the Seven Years' War have been very different, perhaps it may never have happened. Wow, that was a, a global war. So that's interesting to think about if, if the French and Indian War hadn't happened. But before we conclude, would you tell us what is next for you as a scholar and for Henri Francois as a fur trader and adventurer? Certainly. So for me as a scholar, I currently have three articles under review in peer-reviewed journals. And of course, uh, like most historians, I am constantly working on a book manuscript. Uh, My current one is in process, and it is addressing smuggling between New York and New France. I am uh, expanding it from my dissertation so that it will cover the period 1701 until the end of the American Revolution, 1783. And particularly then, it will show a big change then from uh, 1701 till uh, after the post uh, seven years war period when when the smuggling was was uh, decreasing considerably as for Henri he will be uh, appearing occasionally in my classroom as always and this summer I plan to be on the shores of Lake Superior at Grand Portage National Monument which is uh, a fine haunt for Henri although it pushes uh, him out of the purview of the Seven Years' War to the to the modern era of 1793. And where is the best place to look for more information about you, your work, and how to get in contact with you? Sure. Uh, I am easily found at uh, uwplatt.edu, the University of Wisconsin, Platteville. And if you go to that website and search my name, Eugene Tesdall, you will find my faculty bio there under the History Department's webpage. And you won't even have to search for it because we'll include a link to it in the show notes page. Well, Gene, thank, thank you so much for joining us today on Ben Franklin's World. I really enjoyed our conversation. As did I. Thank you, Liz. Smugglers often fly under the radar of society. They just don't want people to know what they're up to. And yet, amazingly enough, several early American smugglers left a paper trail behind that scholars like Gene Tesdall have used to uncover interesting and exciting details about this illegal early American world, such as the fact that women conducted most of the smuggling along the Albany-Montreal trade. I'm also grateful that Gene shared his insight into living history with us, because I don't know about you, But I have often thought about what it would be like to have lived in colonial, revolutionary, and early Republic America. And it seems like historical reenacting provides a good, approximate way to gain even further insight in what it would have been like to live as an early American person. You can find information about Gene, his research, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode, which you'll find at benfranklinsworld.com slash zero two one. Also included in this week's show notes are Jean's recommended reading list for the French and Indian War period. There are nine or ten books listed there that you may want to check out, especially if you're interested in furthering your knowledge of the period. If you would like to submit your questions for an upcoming guest historian, you should join Poor Richard's Club, 
our private social community for Ben Franklin's World listeners hosted on Facebook. To join, visit benfranklinsworld.com and sign up for the Franklin Gazette, a weekly newsletter that contains the show notes for each episode, as well as a link to join Poor Richard's Club. To ensure that you never miss an episode of Ben Franklin's World, you should subscribe. You can now subscribe to Ben Franklin's World via iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, Agogo, TuneIn Radio, and now iHeartRadio. There are a lot of options there, so you can check them all out by visiting benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. And finally, if you are thinking about participating, or if you do participate in living history, I would love to know what period you would like to reenact. Please share your answers with me via liz at benfranklinsworld.com or tweet me at Liz Covart. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.